All right. This is uh, message number 28, believe it or not, in our Life of Jesus series. Can you believe you've listened to that many messages on the life of Jesus? And, and we're just in, we're about a year and a half into his ministry right now. Uh, today we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. If you brought a device or brought a Bible and you want to turn there. And I want to begin by reading a verse that's actually at the very end, almost at the very end of our section. Matthew 9, 35 says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. Now that verse, if it sounds vaguely familiar, it's because it mirrors another verse way back in Matthew chapter 4. Here's Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Those verses are almost identical. So what's the deal? Well, the deal is these two verses form what, what Bible scholars, they've created a term for it. It's called an inclusio, inclusio. And in these repeated statements actually form, uh, function as bookends, setting uh, off a, a particular section of scripture. In this case, the inclusio frames Jesus' early ministry, uh, and, and, and then it, when he called his fishermen disciples, and then it continues for about a year, year and a half. The Sermon of the Mount is in, in this inclusio, along with many, many other miracles, all of which took place uh, 80 miles north of Jerusalem, up in, in the area of Galilee. Uh, now last week, Jonathan took us through what was Jesus' most spectacular miracle up to that point. Never before had Jesus raised a dead person back to life until Jairus, the leader of the synagogue in Capernaum, came to Jesus begging him for help because his 12-year-old daughter had died. Not only had Jesus not raised anyone from the dead, no one had been, had been raised from the dead. It hadn't happened in Israel for 850 years. Now, who can tell me uh, who was the last person to raise someone from the dead 850 years before in Israel? Anybody, anybody know? Guesses? He was a great prophet. Elijah. Elijah, yes, Elijah. I'm, I'm just amazed that you didn't know that. Uh, Elijah was the last one to raise somebody from the dead. Who did he raise from the dead? All right, we're going to have to ask the audience. You get your other locations. We've got people here that just don't know. So. Oh, yes, the widow's son. Thank you. All right. The widow's son, the widow that he was staying with. So he raises the, the widow's son back to life. And this is the widow that kept, uh, had the oil and the flour that kept multiplying. And then nothing happened for 400 years. 400 years. 400 years after Elijah... Uh, Israel's great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, those guys, they began predicting that there was going to be a new Elijah. A new Elijah was going to come, and the new Elijah would visit Israel. And he would do, they said, Elijah-like miracles. But time passed, nothing happened. 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, nothing no, no miracles, not even any new prophets, until Jesus, until Jesus. So here's the high point of the story from last week. Matthew chapter 9, verse 23. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players, they were hired to, to sing dirges or to play dirges, and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Verse 26 says, And the report of this went throughout all the district. You bet it did. I mean, you interrupt a funeral and raise somebody from the dead out, out of the casket, and word is going to spread really fast. Now, the Pharisees were not happy when they heard about this. 
because the last thing that they wanted was for the new Elijah, the one that the prophets had predicted, to show up without their involvement. How embarrassing would that be? It, it, so, it, it, and Jesus didn't fit their mold, their model. I mean, Jesus was a backcountry rabbi from, from Nazareth. And, 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 and I mean, if he was the new Elijah, it meant they had a lot of things really wrong. They were like elitists at every point in history. Elitists at every point, including our day now, would much rather reject the possibility that they could be wrong uh, than change their minds. It, to the Pharisees, there had to be another explanation. Yet this girl who was dead is now alive, and that put the Pharisees in a really, really awkward spot. So much so that, I mean, simple folks, just common folks, people that use their heads are going, um, hey, this Jesus, he heals people. Uh, and we saw him, we saw him raise a dead girl back to life. You know, we kind of wonder if this Jesus might be the, the new Elijah, the, the, the Messiah. So the, the raising of, of or Jairus' daughter kind of marked a, a pivotal point for both Jesus and the religious leaders. From here on, it could not be business as usual. Couldn't, you had to take a side. Now keep in mind that Matthew wrote his gospel for a Jewish audience. Matthew is Jewish, and he wanted to, to prove to fellow Jews, skeptical Jews, that Jesus was the Messiah that the prophets predicted. Now Jairus' daughter gave Matthew a very strong argument. And so what Matthew does is he follows that story with another story, which is our text for today, which also presses the point that Jesus was Messiah. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 27. As Jesus passed on from there, that, that's the house where he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Uh, as, as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. Now, Jewish readers would have immediately seen the irony in what Matthew wrote here. Here you got the Pharisees on one hand that refused to recognize Jesus for who he was, while two blind guys get it. They got it. The blind men follow Jesus through the streets of, of Capernaum, and they keep shouting, Son of David. Oh, that's a messianic title. They're calling him Messiah. These blind guys are calling Jesus Messiah. Messiah, have mercy on us. They're calling out to the new King David to do an Elijah-like miracle. They know that what Jesus just did in raising that girl from the dead could only be done by Messiah. They also know that Isaiah wrote, the Messiah will not just raise the dead, he will cure blindness. Blindness is a very common malady in, in ancient times, unfortunately. Uh, many people, probably the, the highest number of people went blind shortly after birth. And the reason was they were exposed to gonorrhea in the birth canal, which is why they do the treatments they do nowadays. Isn't that why they put the drops in the baby's eyes right away? Um, VD was very common back then. And so these babies would go blind shortly after birth. It was a horrible curse. And it was, uh, it was always irreversible, never reversible. There's no record anywhere in the Old Testament of anyone ever who was blind ever getting their sight back. So to be blind was just a little bit better than being dead. It's interesting that Jesus didn't immediately respond to these two blind guys that, that are yelling, that, that when they're yelling, have mercy on us. Makes you wonder why. I mean, they had their facts right. They're calling him Messiah. They're calling him the, the, the successor to King David. Had their facts right. But they also had the right attitude. Uh, they very humbly asked for mercy. The, the, that's the scene on, in the streets. I mean, they're, they're begging for mercy. It, it could not be more in contrast to what you often see on television stages where someone is trying to to leverage God and kind of force his, his healing hand by demanding healing from someone or, 
or, or declaring healing in the name of Jesus or by the blood of Jesus, as if God is, is reluctant to help and reluctant to, to heal. But if you say the right words, you get the right formula, you might be able to twist his arm and, and, and squeeze a miracle out of him. They're saying, son of David, have, have mercy on us. It was a, it was a heart-wrenching appeal. But it showed they knew the scriptures. These blind guys had been educated. They knew that Yahweh is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love, as Psalm 145 says. And, and Jesus heard them. And, and certainly he knew exactly what they wanted. He knew the miracle they were looking for. But it wasn't until they got in the house, probably Peter's house, actually, that Jesus addressed them. Now look at verse 28. When he entered the house, when Jesus entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? So what was Jesus looking for from them? Exact same thing he was looking for last week uh, in the synagogue leader and in the woman who touched Jesus, the, the hem of his garment, the woman who was hemorrhaging. He was looking for faith. How much faith? How much faith? Well, it doesn't say. Not much, though. Not a lot. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord. That much faith. Yes, Lord. They believed God was powerful. They believed Jesus was God and he could do anything. Look at verse 28 again. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. Now I've said this before, but I, I want to point out again, because this is, this is just drives me crazy with stuff that goes on now, but there is no hint either in this story or in any other place in scripture, that the person who is healed has to somehow sustain the miracle. It is not up to the person healed. Uh, that, is, that is not only ludicrous, but it puts a huge guilt burden on people today who thought they were healed by someone and then find out they weren't. When Jesus healed people, it was always instantaneous and it was always permanent never went backwards nothing about faith necessary to sustain the miracle know what else is missing in this story nothing about whether the blind men were Armenian or Calvinist <laughs> no, nothing about whether they believed in a pre-trib rapture or mid-trib rapture or no rapture or whatever Nothing about speaking in tongues, nothing about uh, raising their hands when they say how, hard, how high should you raise them, just one or both hands, nothing about that. Nothing about whether they were Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian or Catholic. Nothing about political affiliation, were they right or left, or, or did they like paying taxes to Rome or did they not like paying taxes? People get all worked up, Christians get all worked up about peripheral stuff when all that really matters is what you believe about Jesus. Sean and I were talking a couple days ago about uh, the one thing that matters, the one thing that rescues people out of hell and puts them in heaven, it's just one thing, just one thing. What is that one thing? Do they believe? Just like these blind men. Yes, Lord. Do they believe? Everything else, all the stuff that divides Christians, everything else is extra. Everything. Do you believe? Now, you, it's no news to you that I'm not really much of a scholar. I, I'm really not much of a theologian either. I, I don't like arguing theology. I, I don't try to stay sharp on all the arguments because I don't like arguing. I'm not an expert in biblical languages. There are lots of pastors that know far more than I do about Greek and Hebrew. But I'm pretty good at this. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And he loves you too. He loves you just the way you are. Exactly the way you are. You do not have to change so that Jesus will love you. He loves you. 
the way you are. So however you frame your faith and whatever subjects you use to start conversations with people who don't yet know the Lord, make sure you don't complicate things. Ultimately, one thing matters. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And then once again, ignoring cultural taboos and social distancing, I might add, Jesus put his hands on the men's faces. He touched their faces. He did. You know, we all understand the, the COVID protocols, and nobody's disagreeing with that. Uh, you know, you shouldn't touch your own face, and certainly don't be going around touching other people's faces. But, but you know what? There's, there's something serious in this. I think we have to be careful uh, that do not touch doesn't become a permanent thing in our culture. There have been so many studies over the years of the value of human touch and the need for human touch. A baby deprived of human touch will have brain damage. And uh, we need to keep touching. I mean, Judy Elam loves her hugs. You know what? She's not the only one that needs hugs. Judy, we love you too. We all need hugs. One other thought before we move on. Most of us are not physically blind, and uh, so we've never experienced what these blind men are talking about. But most of us are familiar with uh, what it's like in the dark, in one way or another. Um, your darkness uh, may come from pain that won't go away, unrelenting pain. I, I know that room. I, I, I live a lot in that room. Your dark may be uh, shame. It may be guilt, something that you've You've nursed, kept hidden for a, a long time. You may have been deprived of, of loving parents. Uh, maybe you had an alcoholic father. Someone that you trusted as a, as a child or a teenager severely abused that trust. Or, or as you were growing up, your classmates might have told you that you were ugly or stupid or unlikable. It's a dark place. Some people can live in that darkness for a long time. They, they kind of subsist. They don't really live. They subsist in that darkness. Sometimes the darkness comes totally without warning, pretty fast. I mean, the, the person that you married that thought you were the greatest thing in the world at one time now sees nothing but wrong things. Can't, can't even find anything positive about you anymore. You, you, may, you may wish you could divorce your whole family and adopt somebody else's family because it's so much better than yours. Uh, addictions and darkness, oh, those are twins. Those are twins, they live in the same room. COVID isolation has really darkened life for a lot of people. I'm, not, I'm telling you, a lot of good people, a lot of good people that you and I know, people who have been successful and just cruising through life and doing fine, COVID has them struggling with anxiety and darkness and depression. But here's the good news. Darkness is not where Jesus wants you to live. Uh, he is the light of the world. And curing blindness, in fact, was one of his most frequent miracles in the gospel. He loved giving sight again. The Bible says Jesus calls people out of darkness into light. Of all the world religions, Christianity is the only one that can do this. Jesus reverses darkness again and again and again. So if your world feels dark right now, take, take, take hope. There is help. Reach out for help. Reach to Jesus. Reach to other believers. Get some help. Don't just stay there. It's not good for you to stay in the dark too long. In the end of verse 30, Jesus warns the, the two men not to tell anybody about the miracle that he's just done, like, like that's going to happen, yeah? Uh, it doesn't say why exactly Jesus did this, but it may be that he didn't want to be known simply as a miracle worker, or I think more likely what he didn't want was a popular uprising right at that point, because they, we know they, were, they wanted to make Jesus king. They literally wanted him to be the new King David, and that's not why Jesus came, to be a political deliverer, to get Rome out of, out of Israel. So Jesus asks the men not to talk about the miracle. Of course, they did the opposite, which made Jesus' job even harder from that point on. But in verse 32, 
Jesus does his, his final miracle of this, of this inclusio, a miracle that involved both healing and exorcism. Look at verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. Demon possession comes in a lot of different forms. Uh, in an earlier story, Jesus cast out demons that actually gave the man great power, great physical strength. Uh, in this case, the demons were, were, were somehow preventing this man from speaking. One question that always comes up when we go through stories like this in the gospel is why demonism seems to be so prevalent in the time of Jesus and we see it so seldom in our lives today. I mean, every time Jesus turned around, he was, he was confronting demons. Why, why don't we see demonism more? Are, are we clueless? Are we so rational that if we saw it, we wouldn't even recognize it? Maybe. Let me say three things, though. Number one, demonism is real. And Satan is as alive and active today as any time in history. Uh, maybe we do sometimes miss demonism by labeling it something else. Uh, people do tend to look at you funny if you start talking about demons, don't they? But demons are real and they are powerful. Number two, demonism may well have been more common in Israel during the lifetime of Jesus. And the reason is Satan knew this is, this is high time. This is noon. This is, uh, this is when, when we've got to bring out all your guns. We've got to be blazing. Satan knew exactly why Jesus came to earth. Satan knew that if Jesus succeeded in paying the penalty for all of human sin, he would lose. And, and he was doomed. He knew his, his future. So Satan threw everything he had at Jesus and at the early church in, in the first century. Now, I use the word demonism. I don't use the word demon possession or demon oppression because I think it's a fruitless argument over whether a Christian can be oppressed or, or, or possessed. If, if Satan is targeting someone, it doesn't matter at all whether that demon is one millimeter outside the skin or one millimeter inside the skin. Demonism is real. It's a battle. I've witnessed it. I've dealt with it. And I found it very, very frustrating. Anyone, Christian or not, anyone who is, who, who, who is tempted to dabble in occult kinds of things, whether through seances or through demonic movies or board games or video games, I tell you, you're skating on very thin ice. Don't go there. Don't go there. Satan's forces are nothing to mess with. So why haven't we had any exorcisms at Cornerstone? Well, I think the answer is in the third point. Satan does whatever will be most effective in preventing people in a certain society from responding to the gospel. Now, I spent a lot of time around tribal cultures. I grew up in one. Uh, my wife, my, we raised our kids in a tribal culture, and, and I've spent a lot of time in other tribal cultures around the world. Tribal cultures are generally much more attuned to the spirit world than our culture is. Therefore, they can be controlled and manipulated through fear of those spirits. In most tribal cultures, the best that you can hope for from the spirit world is for the, for the gods, for the demons, whatever you want to call them, for them to leave you alone. Don't mess with me. There, there's no such thing as a loving God that would reach out and, and actually draw people to him. That, that's unthinkable in a tribal culture. You just get the spirits to leave you alone. Athabascan culture where we lived has countless hutlanis, they call them. Those are things that are absolutely not to be done. If you break a hutlani, you are likely to be visited by one or more spirits who will make your life difficult. It's why men 
always, when you pull a bear out of the bear den after we killed it, they always, first thing, they stick a stick behind the bear's eyes and poke out the bear's eyes so that his spirit can't see what you're doing to it. Uh, never leave your gloves on the ground where a woman might step over them. I work in a lot of homes. Don't leave your gloves on the floor, you know? <laughs> Put them up on the shelf. Don't ever brag about an animal that you've trapped or killed. Never hear it. Before you eat dinner, take the best morsels of food off of your plate, open, this, open the door to the wood stove, and put those morsels in the fire to feed the ancestral spirits. You leave the wolverine, catch a wolverine, it's called Doyon, he's called the chief, the chief of the animals. You bring him in your living room and you let him lay on the living room floor for at least one night, sometimes two nights before you skin him. You put dried fish and dried crackers in his mouth and other people come to visit Doyon and they put dollar bills or five dollar bills next to Doyon. Keep his spirit happy. You never let the ravens chew on a wolf carcass that you've skinned. You take the wolf carcass back out in the woods and give it a respectful burial. Fearful people are easily controlled. We have seen that with COVID, haven't we? Mm -hmm. We're living in it right now. Fear of the spirit world doesn't work very good in modern America. Our society tends to deny anything that is spirit world related. So Satan doesn't bother trying to scare us with that. He has other much more effective means of controlling us and our culture than making us scared of a spirit. One of his most, you tell me, what is one of Satan's most effective means of controlling us? Pardon me? Media. Media. Absolutely. What's another? Materialism. Materialism. Yeah. Just distract us with the media. Give us plenty to watch on TV so we won't have time to think about it. Distract us with stuff, with things. I mean, if he can just stoke that thirst for more, more stuff, more fun, more power, then he doesn't need to worry about people turning to God. They don't need God. They got a garage full of toys. If they can just get enough toys, you will be happy. If you get enough money, you will be fulfilled. That is, we, we bought that hook, line, and sinker, haven't we? It's worked pretty well. It's worked pretty well. See, Satan's a pragmatist. He's not going to try stuff on us that doesn't work. Uh, he, he just wants to derail the gospel. He wants to defeat Jesus Christ, whatever it takes in any culture. So anyway, so Jesus casts out this demon. And the man talks, and the crowd reacts. Verse 33. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. So the, here's the crowds. They're moving toward faith in Christ as Messiah. But the Pharisees see, see this as a major threat to their authority. Verse 34. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the, by the prince of demons. You know what? This is a great illustration of someone in an argument, someone who knows that their argument is very weak, and they feel trapped. They're trapped. They cannot reason their way out of this. The Pharisees had no explanation for Jesus' miracles. So they lob this hand grenade. You're the prince of demons. Yeah, you're, you're a demon yourself. It reminds me so much of situations today when, when someone with a weak argument, either their argument is very weak or else they have a, a short fuse. They torpedo conversations with, you're a racist. You're a misogynist. You're, you're a bigot. Okay. The person is flailing. They are flailing. Don't even respond. Don't even bother. Just walk away. That's what Jesus did. Look at verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. See, to be compassionate 
you have to you have to get down where people are at. You have to get into another person's world. The Pharisees couldn't do that. They just they were not able to do that. All they knew is calling people to live like them, calling people to obey them. Just do what we say. Live by our rules. Just be quiet. Do what I say. You'll be okay. That is not a shepherd. A shepherd wants to know what makes people tick. He wants to know what they're feeling in their heart. And speaking of which, when we finish this, this service today, I've asked the leaders of each, each local group to lead a discussion on, on two questions. Number one, what have you found helpful in dealing with COVID darkness? I think some of you have some pretty good strategies and we all need to hear those things. Uh, I don't have to explain what COVID darkness is. You know what that means. We've all felt it. And we know we need to share the good stuff that we've found to, to get out of that darkness. And then the second question will be this, how, how can we pray for each other? That's what Christians do. That's what churches are for. What situations are you facing right now that other people can pray about? You're going to discuss these questions after we sing a few more songs. Eric and your team, once you guys come on back up. And uh, so we'll sing songs and then we're going to have a, a final prayer and then we'll talk about these questions, okay? Let me pray. Lord, we thank you that you're still all about bringing light into darkness. And Lord, we have to confess that even as believers, we're, some of the times that we've lived through in the last nine months have been, have been a little dark. And for many people, it may be dark today. Lord, would you please give us hope? Pray that even in the, uh, the groups that are meeting this morning, that you would give some, some ideas, give some ways so that we can encourage each other, as Hebrews chapter 10 says. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.